Hey, everybody. My name's Adam Neely, and I'm here answering all of your questions on this super fast Instagram Q&A. Super fast Instagram Q&A. Is the lick a dead meme? That is not dead, which can eternal lie. And with strange eons, even death may die. How can I apply the whole tone scales in my playing? Ah yes, the I wish I was back in my time scale. I wish I was back in my time, my time, my time, my time. So the way that it's traditionally taught in jazz education is that a whole tone scale is an available color on top of a 5-7 chord. So in the key of C, on top of a G7 chord, you could play G whole tone. And resolve it to C. It sounds pretty good, although it's generally considered a fairly old-fashioned sort of choice. A more modern approach might be like playing a G whole tone scale on top of a C minor major 7 chord, like this. Another really spicy option that I like is playing a C whole tone scale on top of a C major 7 chord. Woo! Fun stuff. The whole tone scale is a really awesome color and can just kind of throw it on top of anything for that like weird, mysterious, I wish I was back in my time vibe on whatever kind of music that you're making. What's the next big thing in music? I think people across all genres and disciplines are really becoming more concerned with timbre, the actual sound of the music that's being made. I think that's because music recording and production technology is now becoming so advanced that if you don't think about the tone and the timbre of the music that you're making, you're gonna be left in the dust. This goes for literally every genre of music. So, timbre. What do note over note chords mean? So those are what we would call slash chords. The character to the left of the slash represents a chord symbol, but the character to the right of the slash references a bass note. So in this instance we have C over E in the bass. This is an inversion of C major because E is part of a C chord, but it's not the root note of a C chord. Inversions, of course, are great ways of creating interesting movement in chord progressions that otherwise would be fairly simple. Sometimes the bass note is not part of the upper structure, the chord that's to the left of the slash in a slash chord. So for example, if we have G over C, C is not part of a G major triad. So the way that we typically analyze this is we think about the notes of the upper structure in relationship to this bass note. So we have the fifth of the chord, the seventh of the chord, and the ninth of the chord. You could kind of think of it as like a C major 9 chord, but without its third. In that case, G over C could be used in any instance where you might use a C major 7 or a C major 9 or any of that kind of chord. You can experiment by taking different upper structures and comparing them against the bass note and figuring out how those notes in this upper structure relate back down to that bass note. For example, if we have an A over C, the A could be thought of as the 6 or the 13 of the chord, the C sharp could be thought of as the flat 9 of the chord, and the E could be thought of as the 3rd of the chord. In this instance, A over C could be thought of as a good substitute for like a C7 with a flat 9 and a 13. Because it's substituting for that C dominant seventh sound, that like five seven sound, you could resolve an A over C to like an F6 chord and it would sound just fine. You can go crazy trying to figure out all these upper structure relationships back to bass notes. Like you could have E over C, A flat minor over C, D over C. Each one has a unique color and a possible functional relationship to more normal sort of sounding chords. They have this like really nice open and airy texture to them and I really like the sound and I encourage people to experiment with the sounds of slash chords because they sound 
really pretty. Anyway, I thought this was supposed to be a super fast Instagram Q&A, so let's go a little faster then. Advice for practicing music in general, go. Try and go at least two weeks by practicing every day, and by that point, it will be a habit and really ingrained in what you do. Is a school you went to good for classical? The Berklee College of Music is good for a lot of things, but classical musical performance is not one of them. Definitely go somewhere else if you want to do that exclusively. What is the most unpleasant chord to play listen to? If you had like seven piccolo players screeching these notes, <laughs> like at the top of the register as loud as they could play, that would definitely be, in my opinion, the most unpleasant chord you could possibly create. The interference between those frequencies and that register would be really unnerving. Uh, I don't wish that chord upon anybody. How long until banjos become a thing again? Speaking of things that I don't wish upon anybody. I'm sorry, banjo is a beautiful instrument, but let's be honest, uh, it might be a while. Favorite John Coltrane album? My favorite Coltrane album is probably A Love Supreme. It's a pretty amazing culmination of a lot of the ideas that he was working on from his earlier period, but before he went completely into the stratosphere with his uh, later works. <clears throat> One of his later albums, though, that I really do enjoy is a duo project that he did with drummer Rashid Ali. It's called Interstellar Space. It's super avant-garde and far out there, but because there are only two people playing, it's a little bit easier to parse. What app do you use for chord charts and sheet music while performing? Generally speaking, most people that I know, including myself, use Fourscore. It's great for organizing playlists. You can annotate on the sheet music itself, which is super useful. So, yeah. That's what I use. Name that chord. C, low octave, G sharp, C, C sharp, D sharp, A sharp. Okay, I'd probably name it actually C, A flat, C, D flat, E flat, B flat. If I had to assign a chord symbol, it might be like C minor seven flat six flat nine. I mean, honestly, the chord symbol in this case doesn't really matter a whole lot. So instead, let's think about what we could do with this chord. So maybe we could think of it as like a C7 with a flat nine and a flat 13, just without its third, and resolve it as if it was a C7 down a perfect fifth to like maybe an F minor nine. You could also think of the chord as like a C modal Phrygian situation for improvising in C Phrygian. Because there isn't the major third there, it always feels kind of hazy to me. This feels somewhat frigish, if that's a word. Tips for playing Portrait of Tracy on a bass that doesn't do harmonics well. Three things, compression, a lot of it, gain or saturation, and also plucking as close to the bridge as you possibly can. My particular Fender P bass is not great with harmonics, but those three things definitely help bring out harmonics if I'm gonna play Portrait of Tracy. I've heard a lot is that metal has its roots in classical music. Does it? Yeah, so even though I know a lot of metal musicians like to equate shred guitar licks in harmonic minor with classical music, I think the direct lineage of metal comes more from blues and folk music traditions from around the world than it does really necessarily from the classical art music tradition of like the 19th and 18th centuries. Finished a degree in jazz, now I'm majorly out of love with it. Advice for time off in return? Yeah, I don't blame you because after graduating jazz school, I was burnt out on the genre entirely. I hated jazz. I kind of came back around to it by learning how to play jazz standards on guitar, not my normal instrument, and by playing with a vocalist. So I suggest that you take some time off, but when you come back to jazz, try playing it on a different instrument. Like if you're a bass player, try playing guitar or drums or piano or maybe saxophone, because the general framework of the music will be there, but you'll be approaching it kind of as a beginner and there will be that joy of discovery, which really helped for me kind of fall back in love with the genre. What is your favorite type of bean? Black bean, I'm a basic bitch. Best exercises for ear training. So I really like to try and sing along with what I'm playing because it's a great way of getting my ear as well as my body more involved with the process of playing music rather than just kind of like being a passive observer to what my fingers are doing. Which bass overdrive pedal do you recommend buying? So I'm not a gearhead and I am even less of an overdrive aficionado but I'm a fan of dark glass pedals. Um, I can say that these pedals are great and I like them. Uh, they are quite pricey though. Recording material first or performing material first? Man, that's something that a lot of bands have to deal with. Do you record an album and then tour it and perform it? Or do you perform material and tour with it and then record the album? I personally much prefer performing the material before recording it because the material has time to develop and breathe and grow. When was the last time you pooped? One second. 
You thought that was gonna be a poop joke, didn't you? Why do bass players sometimes put felt under the strings at the bridge? It gives a really nice attack and decay that's kind of similar to how an upright bass sounds and fits really well in the mix with a kick drum. And a good way of testing out if you wanna try this is to actually wrap a sock around the strings very close to the bridge. I don't recommend performing out on stage with it because it looks a little ridiculous, but it's a great way of testing of whether or not you like the sound on your bass. Are there any voicings you find yourself using most frequently when writing chords? I really like major seven sus two, which is kind of like a major seven chord, except instead of its third, you use the second, particularly the major seven sus two chord in third inversion. This guy. Bring it back around with those slash chords. What is your favorite jazz standard? Ah, uh, man, if I had to pick just one, it would probably be Lush Life by Billy Strayhorn. He wrote it when he was only 17 years old, and it is amazingly beautiful and complex and rich and delicate, and the lyrics are amazing. The classic version that I think everybody should check out is the Johnny Hartman, John Coltrane version, although I'm also kind of partial to the Blossom Deary version of Lush Life. It's an amazing piece of music, go check it out. How did you get your first gig with Aberdeen? P.S. Great work, fire emoji, fire emoji. So I was playing in a wedding band and Shib Saran, the guitar player for Aberdeen, joined that wedding band. And he referred me to his roommate, Brian Plouts, an alto saxophone player, as well as band leader, for a gig that was coming up. Now that gig was actually my third gig vlog. And at the time, the band that was playing was not actually called Aberdeen. I think it was actually called just Brian Plout's band or something like that. Next we have Brian Plout. It wasn't until after that gig where the band proper formed as Aberdeen. On a scale from one to 10, yes or no? Three. Where can I see you slash your bands perform? Great question. If you now go to adamneely.com, I now have started finally posting where I'm playing and when in New York City and everywhere else. So go check that out if you happen to be in New York. Come out and hang. I'll be there playing bass. Do you mix and master your own music? I do, and I don't recommend it because staying that close to your own music is kind of a killer. It can kind of make you really burnt out on your music, so I have to do it over the course of many months, but yes, I do. Would it be possible for you to make a living of music without your YouTube channel? Yeah, that's what I did for the first six or seven years of living in New York City before I went full-time with YouTube. A lot of weddings and a lot of teaching, but yeah, it was definitely possible. Favorite Ellington song? I'm partial to Come Sunday, especially when Mahalia Jackson sings it. It's just <sighs> so good. Can you play a time signature like 8-5? So yeah, that's something called an irrational time signature. I've already made a video about this, but an 8-5 time signature, as strange as it sounds, is actually technically possible. What it would be would be eight quarter note quintuplets taking the span of a measure. So if this is the quarter note right here, I could play quarter note quintuplets against it to make a five against four polyrhythm. And after the end of that cycle, I would then continue playing three additional quarter note quintuplets out of time from this quarter note, because three quarter note quintuplets don't evenly divide into this 4-4 four, four thing right here. So an eight against five time signature would be like 4-4 four, four plus just three additional quarter note quintuplets at the end of it. So in order to do that, I would actually have to stop the metronome halfway through and then restart it like this. This is a measure of eight, five, ready? That's wild. It's also not necessarily super practical. Irrational and non-dyadic time signatures are rare, so it's hard to like program them in digital audio workstations or notation programs, and you have to do some workarounds to actually be able to get them. They're really fun to mess around with, though, once you get your head around them. Would you take a good paying wallpaper gig over a bad paying gig you had a musical interest in? Not anymore, but that was a choice that I had to make quite frequently back in the early days of living in New York. Like, if you get a great opportunity to play with a cool band, but it doesn't pay that much, you just can't justify doing that when you have a wedding that pays six or seven times more if you're trying to make rent. Fortunately, it didn't happen that often because most people knew not to schedule cool gigs on Saturdays because everybody was in that situation, but it is something that I did have to worry about. I feel like I'm wasting advanced musicians' time when they are playing with me. One of the best pieces of advice that was given to me was to always be the worst musician in the room because that way you can grow the fastest and learn the most from people who are much more experienced than you. I understand that might feel awkward in some situations, but I feel like that's that's a great way of improving. Will you come to China and do a TEDx event if you are invited? Hell yeah. 
I noticed you used Soundtrap in your Thank You Next Reharm video. Why? So originally that video was supposed to be an advertisement, a sponsored video for Soundtrap, which is this online digital audio workstation, kind of like GarageBand. And so in some of the shots from that video, you see me recording drums using Soundtrap. But unfortunately that sponsorship kind of fell through because I was using a copyrighted work, Thank You Next, to promote their product and they were not quite sure of the copyright situation, so unfortunately that project kind of fell apart, but the video still was there, so that's why I was using Soundtrap in some of those shots. Do you write charts for Sungazer? If so, what exactly do you write out? Yeah, so I do have music written out for Sungazer because it's super useful to have lead sheets on hand or whenever we want to play with other musicians and don't want to make them try and transcribe complicated music from the recordings. If you want to check out some of these lead sheets and the transcriptions for Sungazer, they are now up on my Patreon. Uh, so maybe consider donating to my Patreon because it's the patrons over at my Patreon that make this channel absolutely what it is today. Thank you if you have donated. Uh, if you haven't donated, consider doing that. And um, yeah, thanks guys.